21st, um, Ed Finance has a quorum, so we will begin. First up is uh, Senator Swazinski with Senate File 1090, and I believe there is a motion to be made. To send it to the floor. Yes, I move that um, th this bill gets sent to the floor, Madam Chair. 1090. Thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Okay. Madam Chair, um, it was fun to wake up this morning to your letter in the Star Tribune. So um, your literary skills are were tested. Well done. Um, this bill, I have a presenter um, that's going to be presenting. Um, Mr. Uni is going to be talking about it. This was heard in policy last week or two weeks ago. Our kids... Um, they need FIED, they need gym, they need to be moving around, they need to shake their sillies out, I guess is the phrase, a uh, children's game. Our FIED teachers are asking for this bill, they're asking for, um, to have it j gel, to jive the implementation of the bill versus the delivery and avoiding any further confusion. They just want to get to work and they want to um, get the standards in motion and so that's why we're going to move it to the floor for that very reason because the gym, the phi ed teachers of the state of Minnesota are anxiously awaiting um, the work. And yesterday in um, policy, um, I believe it was Senator Duckworth that said we need to take things off teachers' plates and um, this would be one of those things that we could take off the plates of gym teachers and um, so that they can get their work done. So with that said, I do have a testifier. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Ado Shuni. I am the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education and I appreciated uh, Chair Suzinski's uh, gym puns there. It was, it was good. It was a good lead in here. Um, so, uh, well, thank you, first of all, to Chair Suzinski for carrying this proposal to delay the review and revision of the physical education standards until 2026. Just for brief context, in 2016, the legislature directed MDE to revise the physical education standards in the school year 2016 uh, 2017. The department was to adopt the most recent Society of Health and Physical Educator Standards and Benchmarks, but was able to adapt them for Minnesota's purposes. Pursuant to the standard academic standards adoption process after rulemaking and adoption, the physical education standards were to be implemented at the district and charter level in the 21-22 school year. So we review and revise them at the state level, setting standards and benchmarks, and then several years later, after the whole adoption process, then the districts get to work with any academic standard to actually get them in motion in, to steal Senator Swazinski's line, to get them in motion in the classroom, delivering the education actually to the students. The 2000 legisla legislation also required a review and revision of the standards in 22-23, then every 10 years af thereafter. So there was an initial adoption um, and review and revision process in 16-17, and then in the 22-23 school year, so six, seven years later, there would be a revisiting of those standards, so much sooner than on the normal academic standards process, and then 10 years thereafter. Both of these timelines were delayed until the 22-23 school year due to 2021 legislation delaying local standards implementation. So if you remember, the standards were initially supposed to be implemented in the local classroom in the 21-22 school year, but to provide relief, they were delayed until the upcoming school year. So with now local implementation not occurring until just after the review and revision process would start this year, it does not make sense to start the review and revision process. There's very limited information available for the committee who would be doing the review and revision to review on how physical education standards are being implemented in Minnesota schools, which is a core component of the academic standards review and revision process. Engaging in the process would also send confusion into the field that the standards that are about to be implemented fully will not be relevant in a few years. Additionally, gathering the review and revision committee will consume valuable educator time that could be best used in the classroom and gym. 
Just to, just to note, these review and revision committees for all academic standards, including physical education, are made up of educators who come from the field. They use their time um, to come and provide their experience as well as their expertise in review and revising the current standards and looking at the best practices in the field. And therefore, for all of those reasons, it makes sense to delay the review and revision process for physical education to the standard 10 years to allow for adequate local impl implementation of the, of the current standards. And I um, appreciate the time, and I can stand for any questions. Um, Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair, and this isn't a question. I just would like to point out that this actually saves the state money, so I would encourage a yes vote on anything that would stay, save the taxpayers' money and paperwork. Thank you, Senator Farnsworth. Any other questions or comments? Well, seeing none, um, Senator Swadzinski renews his motion um, for Senate file. 1090 to um, be laid over for, for, excuse me, oh, we're going to move it to general orders. So the motion is to move it to general orders. Thank you, Senator Swadzinski. Oh, we're going to vote? No. Thank you. And just a voice vote. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Those, aye. Uh, those opposed? All right. The ayes have it, and it's on to general orders. Thank you, Senator Swadzinski. And don't go far because you're up next again. Senator Swadzinski, Senate File 1753. Thank you, Madam Chair. And could my testifiers come up so um, they're ready to testify when I'm done with my opening remarks? And while they're doing that, Senator, would you please move Senate File 1753 before the committee to lay it over for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill? So moved. Thank you, Senator. Um, for my uh, six years, in the, seven years now in the Minnesota Senate, one of the consistencies in what we're trying to do is get kids to bring them up to reading levels, a grade appropriate reading levels. And we've been at this now for I don't know how many years before I became a senator, but it's an ongoing theme. And, and there's been a balance, I th well in my opinion there's been a little bit too much um, emphasis on the science of teaching, that the science, science of reading, that the science of reading will close the achievement gap, that the science of reading will get more of our students up to grade level reading proficiency. And I think I, I met this gentleman a couple days ago in my office, and I think he, stu he convinced me that his program is not just about the science of teaching, but it's also about the art of teaching. And I don't know what, we're, what program's gonna work. I don't know what, we've, what we're gonna end up doing in the final analysis on bringing kids up to the appropriate reading level so that they can become successful, self-actualized citizens of this great state. But I do know we've gotta keep trying. And, and we've got to fund all these ideas that are coming out of, the, uh, out of people's heads. And, uh, and then something will stick, and something will work, and that will be what we adopt in the final analysis. So with that said, I've got a couple of presenters, so pl please sign in when you're done and identify yourself. Senator Swadzinski, would you tell us a little bit about this bill before we begin? Oh. I I'm going to oh. let the pre um, oh. Oh, presenters do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have two presenters. Um, ben Michi, would you like to begin? Uh, yes, I can. I would rather that Meg Thomas begin. Okay. Is that okay, Madam Ms. Chair? That's just fine. Um, Ms. Thomas, would you please state your full name for the record and you may begin. Yes. I am Meg Thomas. Hello, Mad Madam Chair and esteemed committee. Um, I've been a teacher for 40 years with a lot of different hats. And I currently work for Bloomington Public Schools. And one of the things I've learned over 40 years of teaching is that regardless of what curriculum we use or what we teach, kids need to want to read in order for us to teach them to read effectively. And part of wanting to read is seeing themselves and their interests in the materials we offer them. And this is one of the places the Teachers Forum can help our statewide education system move towards equity. 
It gives children a chance to see themselves and their peers embedded in the positive history of the United States. And there are many stories I could tell you after all these years of teaching, but I'll share just this one. I invited a group of future teachers at Metropolitan State University to look up their birthdays on the teacher forum to see which famous people in African American history shared their birthdays. And when we came back together, one of the young black women in the group was on fire. She had just figured out she shared a birthday with Aesop. Aesop! She had grown up reading Aesop's fables and she didn't know he was black. And not only was she excited, the whole group was excited. It was a big deal to the whole class. And I'll tell you, as a teacher, we, that kind of excitement is what we live for. You know when a group is that excited that they got the information and they're going to retain the information. And this is why I hope you'll fund this work for the Teachers Forum. That kind of entrance point to education needs to be accessible to students from the beginning not just for black kids, but for all kids and their teachers. Because knowing about the rich history of African Americans in the United States breaks up those insidious stereotypes that keep us apart and keep us from building communities where every Minnesotan, Minnesotan can contribute to their full potential. And I will pass it over to Ben to give you the details. Good morning, Madam Chair. I appreciate your attention to Senate file 1753 and also Ex want to Excuse me, Mr. Mitchie, would you please um, state your full name for the record? I will. And then you may continue. Get this a little closer. My name is Benjamin Mackay. Oh, Mackay. I am the founder of African American Registry and the creator of the Teachers Forum subscription service and the orchestrator of the readability level system hybrid software to improve literacy in the state of Minnesota K-12 community. What I wanted to talk about briefly before I get into an example of how the readability level system will work is the intersectionality of the content, which Ms. Thomas just touched on. One of the things that makes our work special to the point where we were funded in 2016 to do a couple of years of work with pre-service teachers at the University of St. Thomas and Metro State University was the fact that our 6,000 or so articles intersected with many other cultures through the last 500 years of stories about African America. I wanted to give you a short list of the white people in Minnesota who are in our database because their lives and accomplishments intersected with the African American experience. Charles E. Vandenberg, the first judge of Hennepin County. James Lowen, sociologist. James Reeb, minister. Derek Chauvin, policeman. Erastus Carvath, abolitionist. Jane Swissern, journalist, Stearns County. Charles Trowbridge, soldier, Civil War. Mildred Jeffrey, activist. Claire O'Connor, freedom rider. I say that to say this going forward, that this intersectionality is a big deal for kids because one of the things that makes our content special to be used in the name of literacy improvement is the fact that it allows kids to see the world through mirrors and windows where they can see themselves reflected and they can see other people reflected equitably. As I mentioned, we have 6,000 plus articles in our database. What I'd like to share with you today is a sample of how the readability level system can work with one of these articles. Now, Artificial intelligence tracks our interests and choices and input, et cetera. We know that if we go on Google search and we look for a car, that suddenly we're going to see car advertisements in our mailbox, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's handled properly by a teacher candidate under the mentorship of our staff, 
it has this great ability to do wonderful things for the habits that people, kids in this case, use when they try to read our content. One of the articles in our database is about a gentleman named Frederick McKinley Jones. He was born on May 5th, 1892. He was a black inventor who lived for a time in Halleck, Minnesota. The last sentence of the first paragraph of his article reads, his mastery of electronic devices was largely self-taught through work experience and the inventing process. Now, the artificial intelligence of the readability level system and the teacher shapes the reading and comprehension goal through the student's choices and the teacher's directive learning objective, which could be basic, it could be proficient, or it could be advanced, or it could be all three. The readability level system working draft could start with that sentence. It's a standard sentence, written at the level of a newspaper reading adult. It's a little long, rather complex, and a younger reader would possibly find it easier to understand the sentence if it were divided into two explained parts or thoughts, such as, his mastery of electronics was largely self-taught and or he taught himself through work experience and the inventing process. Now, a behind grade level reader might still find it challenging to keep the beginning of the sentence in mind while reading it to its end. So the artificial intelligence of the readability level system could simplify it even further under the tutorship of the teacher. The sentence could be, he taught himself about devices, he learned through his work and his inventing. Now, a less adept reader may not know what mastery means or what self-taught is. So our software approach would adjust the original sentence to read simply, he learned about electronic devices on his own. Now for comprehension, student and teacher can revisit specific words, the previous step samples, and the original sentence if they choose to. Together they can also build back to the original sentence at any time depending on the progress. The teachers form subscribers using the readability level system have student progress folders for each student for assessment purposes. They can share them with parents, during an open house or a school conference. Senate File 1753 benefits learners aspiring to become teachers and their students through the Teachers Forum and its software edition. The Readability Level System. This Teachers Forum's unmatched diverse content, it allows all students to see the world through those mirrors and windows that I talked about. Our tutorial work plans are at or above state standards in all primary subject areas. They include pedagogy from the Minnesota Academy for the Deaf and Blind. They also include career tech vocations as well, such as HVAC, phlebotomy, and CRN. Our readability level systems, advanced tech design, operated by a proficient educator that we mentor with people such as Ms. Thomas. What it will do is it will deliver more informed learners, Madam Chair. This mindfulness of literacy will build the potential for knowledge through comprehension in all Minnesota students. Education Finance Committee and Madam Chair, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present Senate File 1753. My hope is that it can move forward to help these children. Thank you, Mr. Mackay. <clears throat> Members, do we have any questions? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Swadzinski and testifiers for this bill. So as I'm looking at this here, I'm, I'm just reading the language. It speaks about a grant program to develop a readability level system. So I'm not sure, is this, is this a brand new system? Are we seeking to develop something? Is it software? Is it who has access to it? Where, where is the technology infrastructure? As I go on, 
It speaks about an African American Registries Teachers Forum. So it's to integrate this new system with this forum. Correct. And I'm not. I, so first of all, I'm not. I don't. I didn't hear anything in the testimony of, of details of what the system is, or who's going to build it, or what it's going to become when it's done. I didn't hear anything about details about this forum and how the this the integration occurs. I, and then I see uh, on line 1.14, it speaks about the African American registry must allow. So th they must allow to use the teacher, the Minnesota Teacher Preparation Institutions, but it doesn't say that they have to use, it doesn't say who's gonna use it, what that uh, interaction is gonna look like between, and, and what does use mean? And then it speaks about a maturity metrics, and I didn't hear anything in the testimony that, that is, I, so it, in essence, what I'm asking, uh, Madam Chair, and to the, the, the chief author, I'm not understanding what this bill is seeking to accomplish. What I heard was, uh, references in the testimony database. I heard AI changing sentences from one form to another. I think that's what I heard. I heard a list of white people interacting with black people. I just, I'm not understanding what this bill seeks to accomplish and what we're gonna spend a half million dollars on. If you could just clarify, sure. uh, Ms. Senator Swazinski. Um, I'll, I'll, Senator, let the, I'll let the testifier answer it. Thank Mr. Mackay. Yes, uh, the bill is attempting to take culturally relevant content and put it in a construct where it can be understood by any level reader with the artificial intelligence software, the readability level system. The handout that was issued to the committee speaks to the organization, Scion, run by Mark Kelly, who is going to be our, uh, our website creator, uh, the software creator. We plan on Im implementing that into the teacher's forms lesson library so that we can evaluate both content and the readability level system going forward for all students that are going to be using the material. Two years ago, no, four years ago, we did the same work with the University of St. Thomas and Metro State University, schools of education and urban education respectively. We now have Concordia University St. Paul and the University of St. Thomas ready to do the same work with the teacher's forum after the creation of the readability level system, which could happen this summer if the bill passes and we are able to finance that piece. We plan on working it into the fall semester this year, and we should hit the ground running with full implementation after Christmas break, indefinitely. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, so then in regards to the artificial intelligence and the software, is this a software that currently exists? No. And it's gonna be, okay, so it's brand new. And you're looking for something that's gonna be this fall. Uh, being in technology myself, mm -hmm. I, I am very skeptical of the ability to create from scratch an artificial intelligence algorithm or system to be able to proof test that mm -hmm. and then to integrate that with a website and a reading level system mm -hmm. and to do that with a half million dollars. I mean, half million dollars would be possibly just the, the technology infrastructure to host this. We've already scoped. Mr. The, Mackay. We, yes. We've already scoped the readability level system. We have a full report in the Minnesota Department of Education that shows how we're going to build it. And so what is left is merely taking that information, that scoping, that diagnostic, and applying it. And my web developer, uh, Mr. Kelly, says that he can do it in four to six months. Mr. Lucero. Okay, well, I'll just finish with, with this, Madam Chair. Uh, having been in uh, technology for over 20 years, having been part of many different infrastructure build-outs, having been part of uh, many different softwares that would go on top of the infrastructure build-out. Building something from scratch, especially when talking about artificial intelligence? Part artificial intelligence, not total. Okay, so anyway, I, I just, Madam Chair, I'm very skeptical that this is even possible. And so I'm very concerned about uh, this money and there's just, there's very little detail in here and I see, I mean, this, this bill is only 
six, six, seven lines long and to spend a half million dollars and there's very little detail, accountability, benchmarks to, to, to measure and I'm just very concerned about this. So that, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Cruin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is, I believe you, you said a name of somebody who's going to be responsible for the content that goes into this database, but can you explain in more detail who decides what gets put into this, what articles get put into this? Are they all newspaper articles, from, or are they, is it new content? Um, and then I, I'll have a follow-up after that. Thank you. Mr. Mackay. Thank you, Madam Chair. The content that will be used to be part of the readability level system has existed in the website African American Registry for over 15 years. There are over 6,000 articles in that website that translate into 52 different languages. That is the content that any student and any teacher can extract to use in <coughs> any basic subject area at any K-12 grade level to be run through the readability level system. Uh, follow up, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the handout we, we have, it does say that you know, this is an ongoing thing to stay current. Our articles and media are added or updated weekly. So I guess my question is who's going to be responsible for adding content to this database? on an ongoing Ms. basis. Mr. McKay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am the last stop for publication to the articles on the website. Mr. Kroon, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you're, you're responsible for the content uh, that goes into this. My next question would be how does, how do you envision how does this bill contemplate this content being incorporated into the classroom? Mr. Mackay. Would it be helpful then if I, as a teacher, address that a little? Perhaps, um, um, Ms. Thomas, if you would like to respond? Yeah, I, as a teacher, I'll tell you that how it's incorporated depends a lot on the age level the teacher and the content level you're addressing. So there are lesson plans on the registry to support teachers to address this from a wide variety of different perspectives. As an early childhood teacher, I've had to be somewhat creative. We've, we've been working on this. So I might print pictures that go along with our content because children don't always see the contributions of African Americans or don't always envision when they say scientist or, or um, astronaut. They don't always picture somebody who's black. Later on, we've had high school students who just assign students to look there. But students always have choices about which pieces they pull. Teachers are always supervising and guiding what pieces are appropriate for the age level and for the content member, the content that they're teaching. Senator Crew and follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I don't mean to oversimplify this. I, I'm just trying to, is, is, is this kind of envisioned as, um, as another curriculum resource that this bill um, must be, uh, the state is mandating, must be available to all school districts and the, and the state is paying for it, but in essence, it's another curriculum resource, is that correct? Yes, and the readability makes it easier to access for teachers in the early grades. And on, again, as an early childhood educator, I will say that stereotype acquisition is very high in early childhood to third grade so making this more accessible and easier to access during this time when teachers are stressed and when we can make things easier, more happens. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this will be my final question. Um, 
I don't see this in the bill specifically, and I just want to ask the question to make sure. It, is there anything in this bill that would require school districts to use this resource, or would this just be ava an available resource to schools that the school district, pursuant to their existing policies on curriculum, could either take or leave? Senator Swatsinski? Well, the language says must be made available. So I guess that does imply that it's local control whether or not they decide to use it, but it must be made available according to the language that's only set six to seven lines long. Well, okay, any other questions? Senator, excuse me, Mr. Mackay. Thank you, Madam Chair. In regards to your question, Senator, uh, we worked for a good half a decade in K-12 uh, looking for schools to introduce the teacher's form to their classrooms. And we were not as successful as I thought we could have been. And I'm not here to say exactly why, because I'm not an area superintendent or I'm not a principal. But what I did find is that as Ms. Thomas said, many licensed teachers who are working are very, very overwhelmed, either with class size or administrative details or, or anything else that might be in front of them to keep them from being closer to the perfection that they want for their craft. And so the idea that I came up with was to go to the area where they train teachers to become teachers. And that's where teacher education departments at places like the University of St. Thomas, Metro State, Concordia University, St. Paul, Minnesota State University, Mankato, all of these places that we have had conversations with where we will and hope to implement the teacher's forum with the readability level system in the future with state support. What I did find is that young people who are trying to learn to be a teacher are more interested in learning because they have the time and they're automatically in that environment to get the training, to go to licensure and to become a student teacher, teacher's aide, and then get their own classroom. And there was an openness from them and the chair departments for something that was new and different and reflected from a curriculum standpoint, the browning of the classrooms and the needs of those students for content and pedagogy that reflected the lives that they lead. And that is why we are doing it with those departments rather than K-12. What happens is teachers who are trained with the teacher's form end up going into K-12, and therefore they bring something that they've already implemented better into their work plan when they hit the ground running as a licensed teacher. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I mean, my, my experience in schools is that school districts are kind of actively looking for this type of curriculum resource, and there's a lot of organizations out there that offer curriculum resource uh, products. I guess my only concern here is that there's nothing stopping this from moving forward through the ordinary process, which would be building a demand that the school districts would want to buy this product uh, in the ordinary course of how they go about choosing their curriculum. Um, and this seems to be kind of uh, you know, cutting in line to go to the state, uh, not cutting in line isn't the right word, but going to the state to, to get the funding and then mandating its availability in all the school districts. If the product was, um, you know, ready and, and the interest in the, the demand was there, the, the market would kind of take care of this and the school districts would be clamoring to get their hands on this and pay for it. So I'm just trying to understand why the state needs to step in and and kind of fund it if the product is that good that the school districts want it. 
Um, can I speak to this a minute? As some, Ms. Thomas? Yeah. Um, what I have found, I've been working for at least 30 years in the field of equity and education in a variety of nonprofits and also um, briefly uh, was the facilitator for the Professional Development Council through DHS for early childhood education. And people speak to equity in education, but what I've seen across, and my colleagues across the country see is that districts often don't budget for that. It's coming in from the side, it's not hitting assigned targets, and it's people are excited about it, but they, they don't have it set aside in their budget. And Minnesota's not alone here. So I think the African American registry is not alone in having to find other ways to get in and to offer it without cost to districts, be, just simply because it's not in district's line item. I, don't, I can't tell you why that is, but we've seen it all over. Yep, and if I may just interject, um, <clears throat> part of my job as a library media specialist all those years was to build um, uh, resources to build a, um, you know, a, 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 a table of resources that, that teachers could use for different um, uh, curriculums, different themes, on th those sort of things. And um, as the library media specialist, I was responsible for posting all these different resources on our website, making it accessible to the teachers, making it accessible to the students. And so um, when I think of, of this program, I think of how, um, well, this month is African American um, um, History Month and how my teachers would come to me or my students would come to me asking me for resources, either in, in print form, um, journal form, but especially online that they would be able to access. And, um, you know, we were always very limited to the subscription, what my school could, could pay for. So a lot of this was district-wide, like online encyclopedias or databases, but also much of these, um, these online resources were specifically funded by the school. And as we know, as budgets got narrower and narrower, um, many opportunities to buy or add these additional resources, especially online resources, um, became unavailable. And that meant that there was a lot of um, misinformation. I mean, I, I, I think about how we could use this if kids were doing reports on famous inventors or those sort of things, or when we're doing Minnesota history and you want to find you know, a wide variety of folks that contributed to uh, the success of our state. And I, I guess that's how I would see it, um, Senator Kroon, and just making it available uh, this bill does is a one-time appropriation. It does come with a report, and so I would be really curious to see that report. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Mackay, um, you did get support for this program in the past, did you not? Yes, Madam Chair. And I believe it was Senator Pratt that was the author of the bill in the Senate. Am I correct? That's correct, ma'am. Yep. And then there was a report that came out after you received those dollars, and so I've asked that um, that information be shared with our, um, with our members as well. So thank you. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, so I went to St. Thomas, and, and this committee has heard me talk about the teacher preparation there, and I graduated in 2000, um, felt completely unprepared to teach. And so, um, and, 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 and I've said this before, I think a lot of the programming that we have our student teachers or our, or our um, teachers candidates do, I think, is, is sort of useless. And so I look at something like this and think that it possibly could have helped me. When I first started teaching, I remember there were days where I was like, I don't know what to teach. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to teach something differently than just to stand up there and lecture. But a couple of questions about this. Um, so, so it's a $500,000 appropriation. So looking at the website, and I've kind of been looking through your website as we've been doing this today, I see that for an elementary school, it's a $5,000 a year membership, high school 7,000, and maybe this is for a different component that, that your organization offers. But with this appropriation, then can I assume that school districts will, at least Minnesota school districts, we don't wanna spend Minnesota money to give Wisconsin school districts a discount, but um, 
can we assume that Minnesota school districts will get a steep discount on this five to seven thousand dollar a year charge? Mr. Mackay. Thank you, Madam Chair. The answer to that is that money there, that that rate card, if you want to call it that, is there for the schools that uh, the senator was speaking to if they want to bring in the teachers forum to their full school, all 120 teachers or whatever the number is, they would pay that and we would bring in people like Ms. Thomas and others to work with their staff for a full year. Now what this bill is going to do has nothing to do with K-12. It has everything to do with higher education. It has everything to do with working with teacher candidates who are training to become licensed teachers. They will bring, they will be mentored by the Meg Thomases of our staff, and they will bring a year's subscription with them to the first school that they come to when they graduate and get their license going forward. Again, this is for higher education work solely. I hope that answers your question. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so after the year subscription, then is there an ongoing cost that the teacher or the school district would have to pay to continue using this, or is this something that's just going to be available for I think free? Mr. Mackay. Thank you, Madam Chair. That page also indicates that an individual subscription is $250, I think. One ninety five, it looks like. Yep. One ninety five. And and that's the going price for an academic book on curriculum. And I have a follow up question. That um, that subscription, one hundred and ninety five dollars, is that specific to a teacher or is that a school wide um, like a school wide um, access? That is for one teacher. Thank you. Ms. Thomas, you had something to say? Just to comment that, you know, this is a legislative, um, I can't think the word, I'm having a moment, but the money is for a couple years, so we need to be able to continue to fund keeping it up to date and continuing to add lesson plans and resources. So that's why the subscription continues. Any other questions? Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing me to ask another series of questions that I, I thought of as I was listening to Senators Farnsworth and Kroon. Uh, so in regards to lesson plan was just mentioned, I, I heard that this has nothing to do with K through 12, but it has to do with uh, higher education only. When I think, uh, so asking more detail on that. So when I think lesson plans, I'm thinking teachers in front of the classroom not teachers while they're learning to be teachers. So, Ms. Thomas, maybe we need to be a little clearer. This is a resource for K-12 teachers. The money is funding, making it a better resource for K-12 teachers, but it's targeted at pre-service teachers because what we've found to be effective over the years is helping teachers, as you talked about, Senator Farnsworth, during that vulnerable period where they're trying to figure out how to go into a classroom, often with students who grew up very differently than they did, and preparation. So that's where we're targeting helping teachers get ready, also because it's easier to help teachers learn to use this in that beginning stages of their education. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Follow up? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a series of questions here. Uh, so, okay, so how do I rectify that with the earlier comment that says nothing to do with K through 12? Well, Senator, uh, Mr. Uh, McKay. Thank you, Madam Chair. It has everything to do with K-12 by preparing the teachers that are going to be teaching K-12. A K-12 teacher is welcome to spend a couple of hundred dollars and get a year's subscription to the teacher's forum if they choose to and they will get the same support that the teacher candidates that we hope to be able to work with going forward will get if this bill passes. Um, 
so I, I think to try and make this clear for you, Senator, is that what Ms. Thomas was saying about allowing teacher candidates who are learning how to be a teacher to see this vast resource and the pedagogy that accompanies it in the teacher's form to help them craft their learning goals in and around this work is the value piece going forward that brings us here this morning. We did this for two years with St. Thomas and Metro State. 30% of those students, about 700 of them, were from greater Minnesota, rural Minnesota, and they were going back to greater Minnesota to do their teaching. And the rating on the report that is in the Senate library, it's been there for three years, gave us an 80, over 80% 80 approval rate by the assessment that we use inside the teacher's form, which is a series of surveys that ask all the teacher candidates, what did you find? What were you looking for? What will happen if you go to a, a school where um, there's a teacher across the hall from you who's been there for 40 years and really doesn't care that much about bringing diverse content into that building? How are you going to cope with that environment? If you don't get the support from your principal for what you want to do, how will you respond? That's the kind of assessment that is built into it. And that's where that 80% approval rating gave us the information that we can move this forward and help teachers of tomorrow hit the ground running with a more diverse lens to work with to the grade level and the subject area that they want to teach. Thank you, Mr. Mackay. A follow up, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so then I, I come back to the bill only state uses the language must allow Minnesota teacher preparation institutions to use. Again, there's no, I, I just don't see anything in here that's going to require anybody to incorporate anything into any kind of teaching, whether they are teachers in institutions or whether they are teachers in the classroom. And I, I'm trying, I, one of the things I, I really try to work away from is duplication, redundancy. That's one of the things we, we try to, to get away from and, and to increase efficiency. And so everything I've heard described, literary works, very important, the history of, of uh, black Minnesotans and their contributions to Minnesota, all of this is already available at our fingertips with another AI algorithm or, or uh, system, Google. Right? We can Google any, give me literary works from the 1980s forward that are from black authors and have roots in Minnesota. Right? All this stuff can be found. And it doesn't need to be paid for right now. So I just, again, I'm, I'm just struggling with why we would spend money on something that is already available at the fingertips of teachers in institutions as they're learning to become teachers or teachers in the classroom. All of these systems that I'm hearing already exist and are available and I just am having a tough time that we need to spend more money on something that appears to be duplicating the existence of, of technology and information already available. So with that, I'll finish with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure, and, and Senator Lucero, I guess um, I, just my thought as I was listening to you is that as a teacher, when we're planning and making lesson plans or themes or those sort of things, um, we can Google all of that information and we can spend a lot of time um, assessing the information and um, recreating the, the the information and trying to build it into a lesson plan or a theme. This resource already has those lesson plans available, so it's not just um, a database of all these African American folks that are sitting there, but there's also a lot of, they've done a lot of that work for the teachers already. Am I correct, Mr. Um, Mackay? Yes, Madam Chair, you are correct. Thank you. I'll just say I've used Google and I've used this as a teacher and it's really different. I, when I use Google, I'm on there for hours 
trying to verify the information, trying to make sure I got some depth when I use the African American registry. I'm sometimes on there for hours because it's really interesting, but it's a choice I made, not a headache. Yep. I mean, I can remember looking up subjects and going down that, that rabbit hole because there's like so much information. And before I ever shared it with my students, I needed to verify that the information was correct, that it's up to date, that it's verifiable, all of those sort of things. Um, and so, well, members, we do have another bill unless you have a burning question, Senator um, Farnsworth, and then we will move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I sort of want to echo what Senator Lucero said. So, what, you know, I mentioned when I was teaching, and, and this isn't a criticism of this program. I think this is a worthy program, but my concern, so when I first started teaching, uh, teachers at Moundsview back then got $200 a year for professional development, and I would spend that, you know, I, I, I was there for a year before I wised up and moved back up north. Um, I spent the $200, I got four books, and I remember I got an a African-American history um, source document book, a Native American, because, you know, trying to, trying to bring diversity into the social studies curriculum. And I think I still have those books, actually. They let me keep them when I, when I, um, when I left. But my concern is you, you mentioned teachers are looking for, looking for these resources, so this is $195 a year. Um, I don't know what teachers get for a curriculum budget these days, but let's say it's, it's double to 400 I would have a hard time spending half of my budget for just for just one of these resources. And so that's, that's sort of why I was asking the question, are Minnesota teachers gonna get this for free or at a huge discount? Because again, I think it's, it's probably something that's very valuable and would be very valuable, but my concern is that we're gonna pay to create this program and maybe teachers will use it for a couple of years and then they'll be like, ah, I don't wanna use my, my curriculum budget uh, on this. Um, just a quick search, you know, I found Reading Vine website, so sort of what, what um, Senator Lucero was saying, I was able to find a lot of source documents for free on the internet, and my concern is that we're going to pay a half a million dollars to create this, and teachers might use it when they have it for free, and then they're like, well, no, I'd rather spend my, my curriculum money on something else, and then they just go, you know, find these free websites. So again, not a criticism of the program, but it's, a, I think, a, a criticism of the long-term sustainability without future state dollars. Um, being put into the program. Thank you, Senator. Um, so with that, um, Senator Swadzinski, do you have any final words? I do. I just have four quick things I just want to point out. If any of my colleagues are um, still skeptical, I'm sure Mr. Mackay would be more than willing to um, meet with you individually and um, so pour over some things that you're still concerned about. Um, I think there's, second, I th think there's a lot more to teaching than just Googling. Um, so with all due respect, Senator, our teachers just don't Google, because if that was the case, why even leave home? Because we can Google everything, all the information we're teaching. So there's this thing called the art of teaching and the science of teaching, and I think that's what this program does perfectly. I think half a million dollars, is, is a lot of money, and um, but I think this program's going to work. I think you're, we're, we're going to be in a couple years from now going, this is one of the programs that succeeded in getting kids to love reading. Um, and, and I guess lastly, I'll just leave it at this. For some reason, in third grade, I really got turned on to reading. I, I don't know what happened. And, um, but I do know we had this program called SRA. I don't even know what it stood for. Maybe um, Madam Chair knows um, as the, the media specialist, but it was this program called SRA. And it, it literally was exactly what he's, what Mr. Mackay is trying to do in a pre-technology world. And so I went, when I met with him, I was listening to him talk about his program, and I'm like, well, that sounds like SRA, what we did in third grade. So while he was testifying, I just leaned into Ms. Thomas's ear just to see if she, because I don't know if it was a Wisconsin program or what, but I leaned into her ear and I just said, so where'd you go to school? And we went to high school together. So I'm gonna, I wanna find out um, what year we grant. I mean, I know she told me, but anyways, with all that said, I do want to finally point out that um, the bill 
I don't remember this session a Democratic authored bill that has more Republicans on the bill than de Democrats. And so that is um, truly bipartisan, and three of the five authors are Republicans. So with that said, um, thank you, Madam Chair, for he hearing this. I think it's going to reap some pretty strong benefits in the final analysis. Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Lucero. Very brief, and I appreciate the, the comments. Your comments about third grade and, and getting a passion for reading brought me as a flashback to Mr. Morris in my third grade, and what he did to incentivize us to reading, which where I gained a, a passion, was those who read the most books every month were treated to Bridgman's and got the uh, Lollapalooza. Ooh, la la, I like that kind of which plan. Was, which was probably under a buck at that time. <laughs> Well, thank you so much um, to our testifiers and Senator Swadzinski. And with that, um, Senator Swadzinski renews his motion to lay this over for possible inclusion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Moving on. Thank you. Uh, next we have Senate file. Where am I? All these papers here. Here we go. Senate file 1080, Senator Housechild. If you would like to come up to the table and bring some of your testifiers, we will begin. Senator Umu Verbaden, would you uh, make a motion to move House or Senate File 1080? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. I'll move for possible inclusion in the omnibus. Thank you so much. Senator um, Housechild, would you um, please um, introduce your bill and uh, tell us a little bit about it? Thank you, Chair Kunish and committee members. Uh, I'm excited to present Senate File 1080, a career and technical education revenue formula change. When we talk about education, one of the things I'm most interested in is how we're providing the best exposure to opportunity for our young people. Finding those catalyst moments when a child becomes inspired is what most drives them to not only be successful, but happy, fulfilled, and driven. With that said, not every child fits perfectly into the standard education format. Not every kid is going to feel inspired by chemistry or algebra or history. In fact, some may feel the compounding pressures of these courses and fall behind. While career and technical education may not be a silver bullet, it does provide a wider range of options for our young people to find inspiration, technical skills, and opportunity. From agriculture and healthcare to manufacturing and cosmetology, from a young person helping serve patients as a certified nursing assistant to a young woman entering the construction trades. These are the opportunities we need to ensure we provide for our young people. Sadly, our funding for career and technical education has not kept up. In the 1980s, vocational aid was at a level where funding covered 50% of program costs. Slowly, funding declined to where most districts receive very minimal amounts, which is why we've seen less shop classes, less career training, and less engagement with real world skills and opportunity. Under current law, a school district's CTE funding equals only 30% of the district's approved expenditure. This bill would propose increasing CTE funding from 35% back to its original 50% of eligible expenditures. This increase would be provided through state aid, showcasing Minnesota's commitment to CTE education. With that, I have testifiers ready and will hold for any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, and I'm going to assume that this is uh, Mr. Munoz that is with you at the yeah. testifier table. Would you please state your full name for the um, records and then you may begin. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, community members. My name is Joshua Munoz, Marine Corps veteran, graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in agriculture communications and a master's in agriculture education. I am uh, currently the ambassador for honey producers here uh, in our state, uh, and I teach agriculture education for St. Paul Public Schools. I'm uh, halfway through my third year teaching at Como Park High School. Como Park High School is probably the most, one of the most diverse schools in our state and probably closest uh, agriculture program from our capital. At Como Park, I teach courses uh, like construction and design, small engines, 
horticulture and the environment, natural resources, and of course, introduction to agriculture. Since uh, being at uh, Como Park, uh, our courses has increased. Um, we probably have the highest registered numbers at Como Park within these courses. With only one teacher, it's, uh, it could be, it become difficult uh, with uh, classes being overwhelmed. Um, all my classes are at full capacity. Uh, with this proposed uh, levy increasing from 35 to 50%, It'll help uh, newer teachers like myself uh, grow the programs, add more teachers, uh, support with supplies and equipment um, that are outdated. And uh, lastly, uh, I would not be here, I wouldn't be teaching and speaking to you today if it wasn't for Male C and their programs and their support with scholarship and internship opportunities. Um, with that being said, uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you so much for your um, support. Thank you for your service to our country and um, hanging in there and providing such great um, coursework for our students. Appreciate that. Uh, are we now have um, remote testifiers. Uh, is Troy Hogan there? There he is. If you would please state your name for the record and you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Senators. My name is Troy Haugen. I, am currently I currently serve as the president of the Minnesota Association for Career and Technical Administrators, serve on the board of the Minnesota Association of Career and Technical Education, and serve as the director of career and college readiness at Lakes Country Service Cooperative in Fergus Falls. First of all, happy CTE month. February is CTE month across the country. And th thank you to Senator Hauschild for his leadership on this bill. Secondary CTE programs run the gamut of cosmetology to public safety, to culinary, to construction, to medical careers, to agriculture, to early childhood, to manufacturing, to creative design, to business, to human services, to automotive, to aviation, and far beyond. In short, nearly everything you depended upon this morning to get here in some way, shape, or form somehow originated in a secondary CTE program. From when you flip the light switch on this morning to when you turn your car on or put public transportation, everything at some point in time originated at a, post, at a secondary CTE program. Ultimately, not only do our CTE programs fill the needs of our workforce and keep our economy strong, they are the programs that keep many of our students in school. They are the programs that many of our students find belonging and relevance. Many CTE students leave high school with industry recognized credentials and actual work based learning experiences. CTE programs have many brilliant teachers, as you heard with, uh, with Mr. Munoz, and have strong industry connections and oftentimes bring industry experience and relevance to students. CTE programs fulfill the needs of some of the most brilliant students in our schools as well. Sometimes these students are students who struggle to find success and relevance in many other places. Secondary CTE programs by their technical nature and the peer safety aspects oftentimes require smaller class sizes and equipment and materials that are far beyond what is necessary in a traditional core class that makes them more expensive. Increasing CTE revenue reimbursement helps district recover these costs and continues to incentivize them to grow and expand these absolutely necessary programs to the vitality of Minnesota's workforce and economic future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hagen. Next, we have uh, Mr. Rowweeder. Ro um, if you are online, if you turn your camera on, state your full name for the record, and you may begin. Good morning, Chair, <coughs> Madam Chair, and committee members. Uh, my name is Tim Rowweeder, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of Senate File 1080 today. Uh, I am the principal of Proctor High School which serves approximately 600 students just outside of Duluth. My school and schools larger and smaller around Minnesota are able to provide a high quality education for our secondary students as a result of funding we receive for career and technical education. In Proctor, we spend approximately $600,000 per year on career and technical education programs within our school. Without Career and technical education, we would not be able to provide our students with the career and life readiness skills they need to do whatever it is they plan to do successfully after they graduate. Career and technical education is the bedrock on which a student's high school experience is built 
And no matter if a student plans to go to college or enter the workforce, the skills they learn through career and technical education are skills they use to help them be successful. Career and technical education is not just for students who do not want to go to college. Instead, it is for all students to engage in courses and pathways that match their interest areas and all students benefit from what it teaches them about problem solving, collaboration, and resiliency. I have seen what career and technical education can do for students when they're in high school. The hands-on courses that we offer here and are offered in schools around like manufacturing, journalism, cr criminology, business, culinary arts, audiovisual production, cybersecurity, and many more are magical when I see students who go from being disengaged in their school experience to passionate about what they are learning each and every day. I have seen this reflected with increased attendance and better academic performance among all students. Another example of the power of career technical education is when students who struggle with math all of a sudden understand how and why math is important because they use it as they complete a project or work with an industry partner who shows them that math is a big part of their job. Career and technical education provides an equitable way for students to find their path, whether that means discovering a career they would like to pursue further or finding out that a certain career area is not something they would enjoy. At Proctor and in schools across the state, we strive to make sure our students graduate with a plan instead of just planning to graduate with the help of pathways programs or, or academies. Career and technical education is instrumental in making this happen. While Proctor is fortunate to have many career and technical education programs for a school our size, we look forward to what this bill can do to enable us to expand our programming to provide more opportunities and experiences for our students within our school. With the Duluth area expanding healthcare and the demand for people to fill these jobs, we see this as a signal that we would need to develop a more robust pathway in healthcare, which this bill will help us do. Another goal we have if funding were increased is to collaborate with schools in our area to develop a center for technical excellence where we can share resources and utilize the strengths that each school has to offer in order to match the interests of students across our region. Thank you for your support and consideration of Senate File 1080 and thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, Roa, Roa Weeder. Uh, next we have Mike Harvey online. If you would please state your full name for the record and you may begin. I'm Mike Harvey, Superintendent of Zimbrona Mazeppa Schools. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of Senate File uh, 1080 uh, regarding CTE funding. Um, the increase of the CTE funds from 30, CTE levy from 35 to 50% is, is critical. You know, just our local story, we have a, uh, an incredible number of kids who are interested in CTE. They want to take courses that, that are in the automotive areas, um, the health field, nurse CTE stuff, uh, plumbing, agriculture. Uh, we're fortunate enough, we have a, a local program where we build a house every year. And the numbers for that program have been off the charts for the last uh, six to eight years. And to the point where this last year, now we had to cut out, we, we partnered with the neighboring school in the past. Uh, we had to cut them out because we ended up having to cut our, our kids out of the program. So if we had the ability, we would expand that program and, and partner with that area school as well to help them potentially start their own program. Um, the big thing is demand from the kids and they, they, they're looking for these programs. And when we talk CT, we're talking about those those programs, uh, primarily ninth through 12th grade that are approved programs in, in areas of, of high need in the state. And uh, CTE programs, they build our local workforce. They build our local economies. We see kids that have been through our house project, which we have ran for 47 years, that are now business owners in our community. They're shopping in our community. They're employing additional uh, people in our community. Um, we see this as a critical state economy, and it doesn't matter if you're in rural or urban Minnesota, uh, CTE programs are, are an asset for, for your uh, local economy. One thing to note in when we talk about CTE programs, there are very few graduation requirements for CTE. The result of that, the resulting factors is that um, 
when budgets get tight in schools, and they often are in our school system, they can be some of the first programs then that are cut because other programs are protected because of graduation requirements that, that the state has set up. So it's, it's vital that if we have this levy, we have the ability to protect those programs. Uh, it still remains a local decision whether they, they levy the dollars or not um, and what types of programs they would like to build in their school or in their community. Um, so these programs and this levy will help protect those programs and build those programs. And I myself as, am a CT licensed teacher and um, I'm a, I was a principal, uh, social studies teacher, uh, superintendent, and next year I am actually going back to teach CTE. And that's the other thing that is in, in great demand is we need to keep those pathways open for our CTE teachers gain those licensures so that we can also expand these programs. It's just so vital to our, our local economy. Um, and the whole idea is that we are not just offering, you know, career classes, CT classes. Uh, we are preparing <coughs> our kids to be college and career ready. It's not an or. Uh, we want programs for all of these kids uh, so that so that they can choose in that, that ninth through 12th grade um, years in school they can get to they get to choose what pathway they want to go down and and we want to have career options for them as well as um, college options for them so um, really encourage you to uh, to uh, help us uh, build back the our CT programs across the state with well, allowing local districts to uh, increase their levy for these programs. So with that, Madam Chair and members of the committee, I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Superintendent Harvey. Um, it's sort of heartwarming to know that a superintendent would step down and go back into the classroom. So I was rather pleased to hear that because we know how, how um, the shortage of uh, teachers we have. I don't know if we have a shortage of superintendents, but um, good to know that, that you're going back into the classroom. Members, questions? Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, this is something that I think I can say I'm 100% in favor of. I am wondering, though, um, I don't see a cost if Senator Hoschild has received a fiscal note or if nonpartisan staff has an idea of what the cost of this program would be. Senator Hoschild. Um, Chair Kunish and Senator Farnsworth, thanks for the question. Um, I do not have a formal fiscal note, and perhaps fiscal staff could assist me, but from my understanding, there is an estimate um, of $11 million in fiscal year 24 and $10 million in fiscal year 25. And I think, um, Ms. Hilseth, you can help us a little bit more with that. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator, for the question. Um, yes, uh, Senator Hoschild is correct. The aid change estimated before we get the fiscal note is about 11 million in fiscal year 24. Um, it goes down to uh, seven and a half million in fiscal year 25, um, and then in the tails reduces a little bit each year as that equalizing factor stays the same. So levy, the levy change is about um, two and a half million in fiscal year 24 and then increases to seven million in 25. So as the aid's decreasing in the, um, throughout the years, the levy is increasing. Senator Farnsworth, follow up. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. No, just, just a couple of comments. Again, as I said, I, this is something that I'm supportive of. I, I, you know, I think we've gutted our, our industrial art type of programs, um, you know, even, even fax programs, and so I think we need to work on this. One of the things, one of the testifiers, I think it was Mr. Harvey, mentioned that these programs compete with, with classes that have to meet the grad standards. And so one of the things that I just would like to suggest to this committee and to anybody that's on the other, on the other ed committee is possibly looking at um, allowing something like welding or, or wood shop to count as an art credit. So that, um, because of course it's my opinion that some of the things that these kids are doing in welding is just as artistic as, as a lot of art classes. And so that would sort of offer some protections, I think, for a program like this. The only concern I have with spending this, this, more mon you know, this amount of money, which I think isn't, it's not the spending of the money, it's just there, there aren't people to teach the classes. And so that's something else, you know, we've talked about trying to meet needs. I know up on, up on the Iron Range, we're always trying to steal industrial arts teachers or whatever from other districts. 
And so I think we need to look at getting creative with pathways to licensure in this area because there just aren't the people to hire to fill, especially if we increase the demand um, as, as it looks like we are. But again, uh, unless there's something I'm missing, um, I think this is, this is definitely something that's, that's worthy of moving forward. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I support CTE and public schools. I have for several years. Um, I think we've been very deficient in this regard over the last couple of decades. Um, and I'm glad to see momentum turning around um, in favor of CTE. I have a couple questions technically about how um, the funding of this works, just so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I just, I need to, I'm in favor of the concept. I just need to know more about how this works. And um, am I correct that the intention of this bill is to obviously increase the amount school districts can levy for CTE from 35 to 50 percent and then ultimately have the state appropriate um, the difference so that the CTE programs are fully funded? Is that the intent of the bill? Um, Senator Hosschild. Madam Chair and uh, Senator Kruin, that's correct from my understanding unless fiscal staff has anything to add. Ms. Helsa. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Kroon for the question. Um, so in section one, the revenue uh, increases from 35 to 50%. So that's where about ha half of expenditures are going to be paid for for the program. And then in section two, um, with the levy equalizing factor going on uh, page two line 28 from 7,612 to 13,388, um, that's where levies would increase uh, but again, as property values increase each year and the le levy equalization factor stays the same, that's why levy is not um, keeping up with how property values are increasing. So it's paying for 50% of the uh, expenditures for the program, um, but it's an aid and levy mix that changes throughout the years. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Seth, follow up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the limiting factor, I guess, as I'm understanding it, would be what's found in section two. Um, that's that's now the, that's going to be essentially the limiting factor that school districts are going to be looking at when they are asking the question: How much can we spend on CTE? Because um, how much can we levy uh, for CTE? Um, and then I, I still didn't. I think I understand that part, but I still is the appropriation part of this in section four then will make up the difference between what a school district is allowed to levy, um, uh, excuse me, the 100% factor of what schools are basing the 50% the off, um, is that meant to make up the difference? Ms. Hiltseth. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator, for the follow-up question. Um, so right now, the program is about $36 million in levy and about $2 million in aid. So under this bill, it increases at least for fiscal year 24. The aid will increase to about $13 million, and then the levy will increase a couple million to about $38 million. Um, so it's, it's taking both sides of the revenue formula, tweaking the aid and the levy component. Um, I hope that answered your question, but please let me know if you have a follow-up question. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I do see it's a mix here, um, and, and we're working off estimates, I guess. Um, I'm just trying to figure out exactly um, the limitation then, I guess, is found in the Section 2 levy from a school district's perspective. That's what they're looking at. Um, that formula is going to tell them this is how much um, we – the total revenue amount is that we can levy up to 50% of. Is that correct? Ms. Hilsa. Yes, that's correct. And then so the higher the um, number on uh, page 2, line 28, um, the more levy, levy power the school districts have. So you can tweak that to make it levy neutral. Um, so depending on what that number is will impact the levy authority that a district has, and the rest would be aid. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that response. Again, I'm, I'm in favor of um, increasing CTE, and it does look like some thought has been put into this in terms of the balancing between the local levy and the, um, 
in the state. Um, I, I would just say that even with this increase, um, and this is to Senator Farnsworth, Farnsworth's point about, um, um, you know, the, the people that are going to be teaching these programs, school districts are still going to have to be very, very creative um, to really put quality programs together for students in this space. Um, and that's okay, because I think many schools are up to the challenge of doing that. Um, but there's a lot of practical difficulties in implementing these programs. And so I think we still need to do some additional work on this to try to ease some of those for the school districts um, to, to offer really quality products that the students are going to really want to sign up for um, and participate in. And I, I agree that um, the beauty of increasing this is it increases exposure to all students who should um, at least have an opportunity to see if this is for them. Um, because our society right now needs this. Um, it, we really need, you know, the skills gap is real. We're all going to be feeling it. We already are feeling it. And this can be a, a, a part of the equation to help that. And also, this, the flip side of that coin is to let some of these students know about the tremendous opportunities out there if they have some work ethic, um, that these opportunities are available. And they may not know that right now, a lot of the kids, if their, if their father isn't in a union or um, isn't in the trades. A lot of these kids don't even know these opportunities, it, opportunities exist. So, that's a, so it's two sides of the coin, as I see it, to fill in a desperate need that our society has and to uh, let students know and introduce them to it and, and let them know about the tremendous opportunities. Thank you. And I just want to point out there are plenty of moms that are union members and in the trades as well. Um, Senator Housechild, any final, any um, remarks or comments? Oops, wait a minute. We have a question over here. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to echo the, the sentiment of uh, being a strong supporter of this. Uh, I've often said to, to many people, uh, I spent many, many years in higher education, and I achieved three two-year degrees, two bachelor degrees, and my MBA from the Carlson School of Management. But with all of that education, the most valuable of all of that was my two-year degree in networking, design, and development, technical degree. That has been by far the, the greatest, most rewarding uh, career that I've had in, in my time. So huge supporter. My question, Madam Chair, for the author is there are a couple places in the bill where you change the word vocational to career and technical. I'm wondering, is there a difference between those? Why did you make the change? And is there a defi an actual definition of career and technical? And the, and the reason I'm asking that is, as one who loves all of these programs, who chooses which of these career and technical to potentially incorporate in the schools? Because there's a lot of different uh, fields out there, and they may or may not be considered career or technical. But again, so is there a definition for that, or how does one know? Senator Hostel. Thank you, Chair Kunish and Senator Lucero for the question. It's a, it's a good one. I'm just going to refer to Troy Haugen, one of my testifiers, uh, to perhaps help us answer that question. Mr. Haugen. Uh, thank you, Senator Hauschild, uh, Senator Kunish, uh, uh, Senator Lucero. Yeah, that's a great question. The, the term vocational is actually a, a, a term that basically sunsetted in the 1960s. The, 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 the philosophy of vocational was incredibly uh, useful in that time, but the vocational language is really about teaching a student uh, a specific skill set for a specific job over the course of time. So it was teaching a student a how to do be a millwright to be a to do the job of a millwright for the rest of their time of, uh, of employment. Versus career and technical is about teaching the students about the broad array of, array of careers and preparing for a career in a long term period. Um, so the reason for that change is we don't have vocational programs anymore. Uh, very technically, vo uh, if you look in statutory language, there are only a very few places where voc the word vocational actually exists, and this is one of the only places. Uh, you look at federal language, the only place federal language is actually, uh, the words vocational is in federal language is vocational rehabilitation services, and it's for a very, very specific skill, uh, very, very specific things. You look in the federal Perkins language, it's not 
it's not uh, vocational it's career and technical so that's the that's the really technical piece it's philosophically vocational is very different than career and technical it's very uh, again uh, it was intentional uh it was very purposeful in the 1950s 60s 70s and uh, but it's it's again it's it's a very different philosophy uh, the, 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 the statute 120, 124 uh, D 4531 says it's for career and technical programs approved and there's a whole process that are defined for a program approval with Minnesota Department of Education and they are in those areas that I kind of testified about their uh, trade and industry programs medical careers programs agriculture programs. Um, family consumer science programs and business programs, so those are those career and technical programs. I can get into the technical pieces, Senator Lucero, and I'm happy to go through those things with you uh, too, but they're typically uh, aligned to high skill, high wage, in demand careers, and there's a really broad variety of areas. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Senator Lucero. Thank you. Uh, that was very helpful. Thank you so much. Great. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, um, then, uh, Senator Hustchild, do you have any final remarks? Uh, thank you, Chair Kunish and members of the committee. I will just say um, I appreciate the bipartisan support for this bill. Um, I think it's really, really important that we consider uh, what a student might be inspired by. And I think what this bill is all about is providing more opportunities to exposure to different careers, different uh, you know, have vocations to use a, a definition that we were just uh, defining. Um, and, and I think that's what, what is really special about this. I will say on the workforce issue, you know, I, I, I think it was great that Senator Farnsworth and Senator Cruen brought up um, the, the issues we're facing in workforce. And it's, you know, one of my goals I wasn't anticipating bringing up, but we need to make sure that we're paying teachers the wages that they deserve to go into these careers to teach the future workforce and the future of our, our kids' education. Um, and so that's a piece that I uh, would love to work with, with with folks across the aisle on um, because I think it's really important that we have teachers in the classroom uh, teaching teaching our children uh, in these in these careers and we know that the workforce that many of these career and technical education teachers may have uh, are probably fairly high paying and so if we want our students to be exposed to these types of class classes and career and technical education opportunities then we need to make sure that the teachers that have these opportunities are paid a wage that is comparable to the private sector um, obviously there's you know a broader debate to that but I think that's something that's worthy of, of discussion thank you chair Kanish thank you um, and with that uh, Senator uh, Uma Verbaden renews her motion to lay over Senate File 1080 for possible inclusion in our future omnibus bill. Thank you. Um, members, we um, do have weather coming our way. Tomorrow is Wednesday. We are going to be in person with our testifiers, um, but I just want to let you know that Thursday we are planning to go remote. Okay. And uh, possible that our, our testifiers will be virtual tomorrow as well. But Thursday, we are planning on being remote. We will have our hearing at 8.30 in the morning. So wherever you are, um, we expect you to be tuned in and ready to go at 8.30 on Thursday morning. And if you have any other questions, just let us know. And with that, we are adjourned.